Hey, this is the opening lecture on concave mirrors. Okay, a concave mirror occurs when the reflective surface is on the inside of the curvature. A convex mirror occurs when the reflective surface is on the outside of the curvature. We'll get to the convex mirror later. We'll start with the concave mirror. Okay, we begin to draw out the concave mirror in the following manner. Like so, where the reflective surface is here on the inside of the curvature. Okay, we're going to start with what is called a parabolic concave mirror. Now, in two dimensions on my diagram, this then means that what I've drawn here is a parabola. However, if you're talking about a three dimensional object, then it's what's referred to as a paraboloid. Okay, now at this point right here, go ahead and pause the lecture and then take a look at the first demonstration video that I have for you for the concave mirror. Okay, now that you've seen that demonstration, and admittedly seeing that demonstration on film or on video is not as effective as seeing it in person. At any rate, however, what you saw was the image of the light bulb upside down. The bulb was actually upside down inside the box, so you saw the image right side up on top of the box and in front of the box. This is usually very startling to students when they see it by their eyes as they walk into my classroom. Unfortunately, of course, we had to do it by video. Okay, I'm gonna lead you to an explanation as to why it was that you saw the image the way it was in that film. At any rate, however, I have once again my parabolic concave mirror. The mirrored surface is on the inside of the curvature. Okay, we then draw an axis like so on the diagram. And we draw this axis such that this right here is a right angle and is passing through the center here of the concave mirror. This axis is called the principal. It's also sometimes called the optical axis. Okay, now using the law of reflection, we're gonna to begin to form images. We're gonna start off with the simplest situation of all, which is a point object at infinity. A nice example for context of a point object at infinity would be, say, for example, a star. So where does the image of the star form? Okay, well, first of all, let's say that I have a point object that is relatively close to the mirror, and I'm gonna go ahead and place that point object on the optical axis, like so. And then let's say that I have three light rays that are coming off of that object and then strike the mirror. So for example, I have a light ray here. I have a light ray here. And a light ray here. Okay, now geometrically, watch what happens to these three red light rays when I take the point object and I move it further from the mirror. So then therefore, let's say if the object is now here, like so. And I'm gonna have three light rays coming off of that object once again. I'm gonna have those three light rays strike the same points here on the mirror. So the first light ray is like so along the optical axis, and then once again just hits the mirror right here. Second light ray, like this. And then third light ray, like this. Okay, notice what is happening geometrically more and more to these three incident light rays. They are becoming more and more parallel as I take the object and I begin to move it further and further from the mirror. So then therefore, if you do in fact have a point object at infinity, all the light rays then coming from that object are gonna be parallel to each other and they're gonna be parallel to the optical axis. That then gives you a situation that looks like this. Okay, so once again, right here is my parabolic concave mirror. Here's the optical axis. And then typically what we do is we draw three light rays. And I'm gonna draw these symmetrically. So for example, the first light ray is along the optical axis itself like so. And then symmetrically above and below. Okay, and then all three of these light rays, they then undergo the law of reflection. 
So then therefore using that law, let's go ahead and reflect these three light rays. So take a look at the first light ray here along the optical axis. Because this light ray is along the optical axis, it's along the normal line that is perpendicular to the mirrored surface at this location. So then therefore the angle of incidence is zero degrees, not 90 degrees, it's zero degrees. Therefore the angle of reflection is also zero degrees, and then therefore the light ray just reflects upon itself, like so. Okay, then take a look at the top light ray. Right here is a dotted line that is perpendicular to the mirrored surface of this location, and then therefore right here on the diagram is the angle of incidence. What I then do is I reflect the red light ray on the other side of the normal line at the exact same angle. That then looks like this. Like so. And right here is the angle of reflection, which is the same as the angle of incidence. Okay, now I'll do the same thing here for the light ray down below. Okay, like so. So there's my dotted line perpendicular to the mirrored surface at that location. That's the normal line once again. And then right here is the angle of incidence. And now what I have to do is I have to reflect at the same angle on the other side of the normal line. Like so. We're right here. Once again in black is the angle of reflection. Now notice that all three of the reflected light rays here, here, and here pass through the same point, like so. This is then therefore where the image of the star forms. Notice that it's in front of the mirror, and the light rays actually physically pass through the image. This is referred to as a real image for that reason. In addition to that, if in fact this right here is a parabola, then this point right here is referred to as the focus. Like so. The focus is some distance away from the mirror. That distance is usually referred to as small f, and that's referred to as the focal length. Okay, now this is in fact what happens if you do have a parabolic concave mirror. All the light rays that then reflect off the mirror pass through the focus and you see a perfect image. However, the demonstration mirror that you saw in part one of my concave mirror demonstration is definitely not a parabolic concave mirror. It's instead what is called a spherical concave mirror and there is an error associated with it. Here's the error associated with the spherical concave mirror. Okay, so once again, right here is the mirror. I basically just draw it the same as I do with the diagram above. But now this is what is called the spherical concave mirror. Once again, here's my optical axis. Okay, then if I draw the exact same three light rays as I did up on the top board, the diagram actually wouldn't change. However, what I'm gonna do on this diagram is draw the light rays asymmetrically. That is like so. And now I'll draw the bottom one down here. So notice this is an asymmetrical situation. If I drew this light ray here on the top diagram for the parabolic concave mirror, then that light ray would still reflect through the focus. However, if I do so now here for the spherical concave mirror, not quite. So what happens first of all with the top two light rays? Well, basically the same thing as I drew on the diagram above. So this light ray reflects through itself like so. This guy here would reflect off in this direction like so. Once again, if this was a parabolic concave mirror, this light ray right here would in fact reflect through the focus, but not quite for the spherical concave mirror. Instead, the light ray does something like this. So the three reflected light rays don't quite come together at the same location. So then therefore, instead of seeing a nice, well-defined, crisp image of a star, you would then see a little bit of blurriness, if you will, associated with the image. This distortion is referred to as spherical aberration. The spherical aberration in my demonstration mirror is particularly noticeable when you start to move towards the edges of the mirror. 
That's where you see a lot of distortion associated with the images themselves. You probably notice that the light bulb itself looks a little bit distorted in addition to being in front of the mirror. When you see that, you're seeing the spherical aberration. Spherical aberration, however, is safe to ignore if the size of the mirror, for example, is small compared to the radius of curvature. A nice example of this, and girls, you'll be familiar with this one, is a makeup mirror. A makeup mirror is a compact, concave, spherical mirror. However, the size of the mirror itself is small compared to the radius of curvature, so then therefore you don't really see any spherical aberration when you use that mirror for makeup purposes. Okay, this is not the case for a telescope. With a telescope, everything is a parabolic concave mirror to give perfect images. But with a spherical concave mirror, the bigger the mirror, the more noticeable the spherical aberration. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to ignore spherical aberration. It is safe to ignore if the size of the mirror itself, for example, once again is small compared to the radius of curvature. The reason why we'll deal with spherical mirrors is because mathematically they're just a little bit easier to describe than parabolic mirrors. So that's what we'll do basically from this point forward. Okay, let me go ahead and do a little bit of erasing here. Okay, now let's begin to move specifically towards the demonstration that you saw in part one of my concave mirror demonstration videos. Okay, this is for now a finite sized object that is a finite distance away from the mirror, or as we say, an extended object. So an extended object is an object that has size. We always typically draw it as an arrow once again, because an arrow always shows orientation. Okay, so now this is for an extended object. And a finite distance. Okay, so once again, I'm going to draw the mirror like so. Here's the optical axis. And now right here, let's go ahead and label the focus like so. And then let's say that I take my arrow, my object, and I place it like this. We always put the base of the arrow here along the optical axis itself for simplicity. So right here is the object. Okay, and then what we want to do is we want to form the image. In order to form the image, we only need to two, choose two light rays, but we have to choose them carefully. We always choose two light rays that are coming off the tip of the arrow, and we draw upon our prior knowledge of the focus in order to form the image. So the first light ray that I draw coming off the tip of the arrow is a light ray that is just parallel to the optical axis, like so. And now for my previous diagram, we know how this reflects already. It reflects through the focus, like so. Okay, and then for our second light ray, what we do is we just draw the first one backwards. That is, we take a light ray that comes off the tip of the arrow and it passes through the focus. Draw that a little bit better. There we go. Like so. And then therefore, if this second light ray here passes through the focus, how does it reflect off the mirror? Well, it's basically just the first light ray backwards. So then therefore, it reflects off the mirror parallel to the optical axis. Like so. And then right there is where the two reflections cross each other. Therefore, you see the image of the tip of the arrow right here. Notice that it's upside down. It's upside down or inverted with respect to the object. If we did this process for all points along the object itself, we would find that the entire image forms like so. So you end up with what is referred to as a real inverted image. It's a real image because the reflected light rays actually pass through it, and the image itself is upside down with respect to the object. This is starting to work towards what you saw with my light bulb demonstration. With my light bulb demonstration, I basically had the object upside down here inside the box. You then saw the image reflected right side up like so, on top of the box, and in front of the mirror. 
as we'll see with one of my mathematical examples later, if you adjust the object distance appropriately, you can then make the object distance match up with the image distance as well. That's roughly what I was attempting to do in my situation involving the demonstration. Okay, now I'm going to call this part one here of today's lecture on concave mirrors. I'm going to go ahead and pause here and then we'll get to part two in just a few moments.